Hello and welcome to today's session of this course on literary criticism. We begin discussing a new text by Philip Sidney. This is called An Apology for Poetry, which is also translated as a defense of poesy. And we understand that this is one of the most powerful and daring documents produced in Renaissance England. And this is also one of those texts which laid the foundations of uh, literary criticism in England. It's a very native tradition in that sense that gets, that gets highlighted throughout this text. So at the outset, as we can see over here, when uh, Sidney begins writing this uh, piece, he begins it on a very paradoxical note. He refers to uh, one of the masters of uh, horsemanship that he, uh, who also happens to be a good friend of him, John Pietro Piano, and he talks about how wonderfully invested he is in this idea of horsemanship. And he also says towards the end that if I had not been a piece of a logician before I came to him, I think he would have persuaded me to have wished myself a horse. So it begins on a paradoxical note, on a very witty paradoxical note, almost stating the uh, futility of uh, theoretical practices, almost highlighting the futility of uh, theories. And uh, he, we also begin to notice that this wit and this uh, paradoxical quality that he highlights throughout this piece, it also becomes very fundamental in understanding the nature of literary criticism. At various levels, this is a work which does two things at the same time. It tells us about the futility of theoretical exercises and at the same time it also showcases how the power of persuasion can work through the power of language. And this is one of the earliest things written in Renaissance England where a case is being made out for literature, particularly for poetry. And as the title goes, this is an apology for poetry, this is a defense of poetry. And in order to understand the idea of defense over here, the idea of apology over here, we also need to get a sense of the background. Philip Sidney, who is one of the perhaps most English of English writers during that time, he's responding to one scathing criticism raised by Stephen Gosson. And Stephen Gosson was only articulating and echoing some of the prominent sentiments of those times about the skepticism towards any kind of imaginative thought. And there are four basic arguments which Stephen Gosson had raised in his essay, The School of Abuse. And as the title goes, it's a very uh, derogatory uh, a piece of writing which degrades literary uh, writing said which also talks about the many ill effects that literature would have or literature already has on uh, society and uh, the power it has on corrupting individuals. So the school of abuse, the work that Stephen Gosson had produced, it had raised four major points. Firstly, Gosson states that a person's time could be used more fruitfully than writing or reading poetry. And secondly, he situates, he locates and identifies poetry as the mother of all, all lies, the nurse of all lies. Uh, and thirdly, he uh, identifies poetry particularly uh, among these imaginative forms of literature as the nurse of abuse, something which corrupts. And fourthly, Gosson also underscores this age-old classical point that Plato was right to banish poets. So with the help of the cl classical criticism, with the help of classical masters who were also, play Plato is definitely undeniable in multiple ways, we find Gosson trying to make a case against um, literature, against poetry in particular, and stating that this could be one of the reasons that the society is so corrupted and you need to banish poets, you need to uh, get rid of all these forms of writings because they are not actively contributing to the society. And we also need to notice that in the literary context, in the critical context, during this time, there is a very severe dearth of uh, critical authorities in England. There's almost an absence of any kind of critical authority in England. So we find uh, Philip Sidney intervening at such a point where he is not only defending, but he's also setting up new yardsticks over there. He's also setting up a line of defense against, not just uh, uh, against Gosson, but against many such similar attacks. And instantly and very interestingly, we do not find mm, Philip Sidney taking Gosson's name at any point in throughout this uh, uh, piece of writing. On the other hand, he pitches it in such a way that the line of argument is in response to uh, Gosson's line of attack, the defense that he builds up, the defense that Sidney builds up is in response to Gosson's line of attack, but there's no way in which he gets into any kind of personal attack or any sort of personal insinuations. And um, it's also a good time to recall that Gosson's School of Abuse was dedicated to Philip Sidney. And at this point, it would be good to read up about Philip Sidney and know the kind of uh, authority and the kind of stature that he enjoyed in Renaissance England during his lifetime, the kind of uh, background that he came from and how he had given respectability to the uh, this uh, form of writing, sonnet, which uh, 
or had almost gone out of fashion during that time. So there's a, there are a lot of ways in which someone like Philip Sidney also becomes the most appropriate person to respond to Stephen Gosson because his word also had a certain kind of stature, a certain kind of authority to defend uh, poetry against many other so-called useful uh, disciplines or useful uh, exercises. In um, Sydney, we find a classical outlook. There are uh, a certain way in which he displays uh, some respect for rules, but at the same time, he does not have any patience with uh, the new tragedies which began to uh, come up during that time. And he's also stating this reason for his impatience with the new tragedies. Uh, it could be that, you know, the, the, the reason why he is forced to go back to the classical uh, tragedies and to the classical times to cite and to refer and to give uh, examples, it could be because there is a very clear absence of good plays in England during this time. If you are familiar with Renaissance England, you would also know that it, uh, English literature at some uh, level, it's during a transition phase, it is undergoing many significant changes during that time and it is still trying to figure out a native tradition of its own and it's during that time especially during the elizabethan period that they begin to realize that after chaucer nothing big really had happened in this uh, uh, field of literature and uh, he also in uh, keeping in tune with his classical outlook he advocates classical meters we find he has been heavily influenced by aristotle but he's also a little different in that sense. He talks about imitation for a purpose. There is a sense of purpose that he wants to uh, inbuild into literature, into poetry, into all kinds of art forms. And this also gives a very humanistic outlook to uh, Sydney, which is also appropriate given uh, the time and age during which he was living. And uh, there's another way in which he also begins to uh, depart from Aristotle in a good way and also begin to echo uh, Plato again in a very positive sense. He talks about imitation also in the sense of invention, also in the sense of creating something new. Imitation is not seen as a lesser quality over here. On the other hand, Sydney elevates it to a different level altogether and argues that a poet does not just imit it. On the other hand, he or she makes it better, makes it more useful and more relevant to uh, the readers. And he is also talking about a new world of edification, a new world of delight that the poet also begins to open up. And this is closer to Plato uh, in many significant ways as we would begin to see. But it's also, uh, it also retains the classical humanist outlook that we find in most of uh, Aristotle's writings and his defense of uh, uh, poetry and similar imaginative forms of literature. Sydney is also writing at a time when there is this very persuasive argument that the other forms of knowledge are more useful compared to poetry, compared to imaginative literature. So in that sense, if you look at the Apology for Poetry, it's divided loosely into five different sections. The first section which talks about why poetry should be valued. And second, the kind of poetry and their usefulness, the kind of poetry that one sees around the historical mapping of how poetry began to evolve as a definite form, a definite genre, and their usefulness in different ways. And thirdly, Sidney begins to directly respond to the critics of poetry. He does not, as mentioned before, he does not take Gosson's name, but there is a line of argument, a line of defense that he builds up against the attacks made significantly by Gosson and many others. And fourthly, he remarks, uh, he makes uh, uh, very powerful remarks, almost evaluative, judgmental remarks on uh, contemporary English poetry and drama. And this is also a very significant turn at that point of time, given that there is a very severe dearth of critics in England, in Renaissance England particularly. There's no one to pass any judgment, any uh, evaluative, critical, positive judgment on the kind of literature which is being produced during that time. And finally, in the final section, he also makes uh, room to remark uh, considerably on style, diction and versification. So if you go through this essay, we will see that it's not structured very uh, strictly into these five parts, but there's a way in which we can find that there are these five uh, compartments or the five components that uh, could be identified over here. So having uh, drawn our attention to Giuliano and his uh, uh, powerful way in which he defends horsemanship and the power of persuasive argument no matter how futile it also is and drawing from that paradoxical anecdote, Sidney begins to state what he proposes to do in this uh, piece of writing. And yet I must say that I have just caused to make a pitiful defense of poor poetry, which from almost the highest estimation of learning is fallen to be the laughing stock of children. So I, so have I need to bring some more available proof since the former is by no man 
but if it's deserved credit, the silly latter has had even the names of philosophers used to the defacing of it with greater with great danger of civil war among the muse. So he is also beginning on a way which you know drawing attention to the poor poets who were quite prevalent and very common in England during those times. And there's also a sense of history that he begins to map over here to draw our attention to the good poets in different traditions and he takes us back to the Roman and Greek traditions and he also ends by drawing our attention to the English uh, uh, poets and he particularly cites Gower and Chaucer after whom encouraged and delighted with their excellent for going. Others have followed to beautify our mother tongue as well in the same kind as in other arts. So here he is trying to situate poetry historically and to say that it is not a recent thing which has come about of nowhere. There is a historical trajectory to it and there is a native English tradition also which can be established starting from Gower and Chaucer and he also says that the other fine poets, of course, there were, there are a lot of poor poets who cannot be defended at all, which he uh, uh, states very clearly at the outset. And uh, while in defense of the good poets, which he, uh, which which is the primary objective of this work too, he says there is a historical trajectory for us to fall back upon, and there is also a native tradition which has already been uh, established. And the next thing that he does in this introductory session, he is also trying to position and place poetry along with other forms of disciplines, other kinds of knowledge, particularly about history, which uh, had a superior position throughout classical ages and even during the Renaissance times. And here he begins to state, so that truly neither philosopher nor historiographer could at first have entered into the gates of popular judgments if they had not taken a great passport of poetry, which in all nations at this day, where learning flourishes not as plain to be seen, in all which they have some feeling of poetry, he is beginning to argue that there is some bit of poetry in all kinds of fine writings, regardless of the discipline, whether it is Herodotus writing history, or whether it is any kind of philosophical work, or anything written literally like uh, the, the work produced from Greek and uh, from Greece and Rome. He is beginning to argue that there is some feeling of poetry in all these fine works and all these fine thoughts that we come across as uh, uh, different civilizations. And he's also uh, stating the universality of the presence of poets, that poets can be found everywhere regardless of time and space. Even among the most barbarous and simple Indians where no writing is, yet they have their poets who make and sing songs which they call aretos, both of their ancestors' deeds and praises of their gods. He is referring to Red Indians of course and he is also talking about how even in the most uncivilized of uh, uh, nations, of communities. yeah. Uh, there is a sense of poetry, there is a sense of uh, uh, poetic reproduction that you can find everywhere. He also again draws from the native tradition here a little bit when he says in Wales, the true remnant of the ancient Britons as there are good authorities to show, the long time they had poets which they call bards. So through all the conquests of Romans, Saxons, Danes and Normans, some of whom did seek to ruin all memory of learning from them, yet do their poets even to, do, to this day last. So as it is not more notable in soon beginning than in long continuing. He is also talking about the oral tradition which was very vibrant at one point and which continues to exist across these uh, different generations and time uh, periods. And here he is stating in multiple ways that poetry is not something that can be disregarded, saying that it is a modern creation, it is something that would corrupt people. You need to defend poetry all the more because there is a historical validity to it, there is a historical trajectory through which poetry had also passed through as a form, as a kind of genre. It was an inbuilt thing in all kinds of disciplines and all kinds of knowledges. Even the finest historians had a feeling of poetry when they were producing their works. And even the most uncivilized of communities had a sense of poetry and it was handed over uh, through or orally through different generations. So there are multiple ways in which Philip Sidney begins to make a case, a very learned kind of case for uh, poetry for imaginative literature. And he continues to do this historical mapping and he tries to situate the status of poet across uh, these different time periods. Among the Romans, a poet was called Vates, which is as much as a diviner, foreseer, or a prophet, as by his conjoined words, Vaticinium and Vaticinari is manifest, so heavenly a title that so heavenly a title did that excellent people bestow upon this heart ravishing knowledge. So the poet was considered as a divine being during the Roman times and he's also digging up the etymology of the word and trying to show the connections, even the divine connections that a poet and his work held at one point of time. And he continues to give examples of this sort, particularly from the classical 
uh, uh, period from the classical writings. And he also gives an example which is closer and more immediate for uh, English people. And may I not presume a little further to show the reasonableness of this word Vedas and say that the Holy David Psalms are a divine poem. He is also invoking, he is also citing the book of Psalms to show that there is a biblical reference, there is a religious reference, a divine reference that one can find not just in the classical terms, not just in the distant pagan uh, Roman Greece, but also in the native Christian English tradition. There he is also drawing our attention to this very valid point that even during the time uh, when David Psalms were being written, though there were no rules in place, though there was no criticism in place, though there was no sense of a form for literature in place, that it is fully written in meter, as all learned uh, Hebrews agree, although the rules be not yet fully found. Lastly and principally, his handling his prophecy, which is merely poetical. So there is a way in which we find that Sydney begins to identify poetical qualities in various forms in various sites in philosophy, in uh, history, in uh, uh, religion and in all kinds of writings which were part of uh, any kind of civilization across. He is also very aware, very conscious of what he is doing over here which is what he says towards the end of this paragraph. But truly now having named him, I fear I seem to profane the holy name applying to poetry which is among us thrown down to so ridiculous an estimation. Now he is getting to the crux of the matter. He is entering the discussion in a more fierceful way, in a more powerful way. He is beginning to say that this is how historically poetry and poets can be located, could have been located. But look at the way in which how this has, uh, look at the way in which how poetry has been thrown down to such a ridiculous estimation. And it is this ridiculous, ridiculous estimation that he wants to change and he wants to defend poetry against all these contemporary criticism through a very logical fashion by showing us historical evidence and also drawing our attention to the, uh, to the, to the powerful uh, imagery of historical mapping. And then keeping in tune with a true, in the true renaissance fashion, he begins to use reason as well over here. Now let us see how the Greeks named it and how they deemed of it. The Greeks called him a poet, which name has, as the most excellent, gone through other languages. It comes of this word poin, which is to make. When I know not whether by luck or wisdom we Englishmen have met with the Greeks in calling him a maker. So the poet is now through this semantic play, through this rational way, the poet is now elevated to someone who makes, someone who innovates. And here we find Sydney truly departing from the classical tenets by merely, by not merely locating the poet as an imitator, but as someone who makes. And this makes a huge difference in looking at poetry and looking at poet from a detached, from a clinically uh, detached uh, as well as from a scientific perspective. And this he does very deliberately in order to which poetry against other disciplines and other kinds of knowledges which are considered more superior than it. Which name how high and incomparable a title it is, I had rather well known by marking the scope of other sciences than by any partial allegation. There is no art delivered unto mankind that has not the works of nature for his principal object, which is what poetry does too, without which they could not consist and on which they so depend as they become actors and players as it were of what nature will have set forth. So here. Uh, also think about the discussion that we had in the context of uh, looking at Longinus, how everything is drawn from nature but there is also a kind of direction that this uh, genius has, a kind of uh, uh, technical expertise and technical training that nature needs before it becomes good art, true art. So in some sense at the outset of uh, apology for poetry, Sydney begins to draw attention to how poetry has fallen from its status and the need to defend it. And how does he locate this need to defend poetry which has fallen from its uh, high uh, esteem? First he talks about the first form in which knowledge was exposed and this is how he shows us how the poet is as good as the historian, the poet is as good as a diviner, uh, a foreseer and how there is an earliest, there is a way in which we can look at the earliest forms of articulations in the form of poetry and he brings in the argument of tradition by bringing in the Roman uh, idea of looking at the poet as a diviner, as a prophet and he also uses the native examples by talking about David's uh, Psalms from the book of the Bible 
and he also then talks about the connection between poetry and nature as we saw and how he tries to locate the meaning of uh, poet as someone who also makes and this innovative quality also makes a significant difference in positioning a poet, a poet as someone who does things useful, who does something constructive, who produces kinds of knowledge and forms of uh, uh, thinking. And here we find him trying to situate human creativity within a theological context and that also begins to work in Renaissance England we begin to see and look at the way in which he builds up his arguments using powerful rhetoric either from the classical world or from the native English tradition which is also predominantly the Christian during that time. And um, as we begin to wrap up this uh, discussion, which we shall continue in the next couple of sessions, we also notice that he makes many attempts to overthrow the conventional hierarchy within which the poet or poetry in general is placed. And we end with this passage where he draws upon Aristotle and also shows how he is planning to use Aristotle as well as depart from him in order to uh, restore the status of poetry in England. Poesy, therefore, is an art of imitation. For so Aristotle terms it in his word mimesis, that is to say, a representing, counterfeiting, or figuring forth, to speak metaphorically, a speaking picture, for this end, to teach in delight. Look at the way in which how the classical writers, how the classical critics and the classical uh, tenets, they keep coming back to us in different ways. And which is why, uh, again and again, we reiterate this, reiterate this point that uh, Greek criticism, the classical criticism is extremely important in having laid the foundations of Western critical thought itself. So from this point, we find him beginning to develop his argument, his line of defense further down. And we also find him making a case for poetry in Renaissance England. So with this, we begin to wrap up this discussion and I encourage you to take a look at this essay in original so that you will also get a better hang of it when we come back to talk about this more. I thank you for listening and I look forward to seeing you in the next session. Mm -hmm.